Hello, my name is Connor Hicks. I'm the founder of Suborbital. I founded Suborbital to bring about a step change in how we think about and deploy cloud compute by using WebAssembly as a new technology for packaging our software. So this talk is all about WebAssembly and why you would want to run it inside of a Go application. Uh, we're gonna cover what WebAssembly itself actually is, then we're going to look at why you would want to do this in the first place, and we're going to talk about how you can go about doing it if it sounds like something you want to do, and then we'll talk about some use cases and cover some things that you would want to do in the real world with this combination of technologies. So we'll start with what is WebAssembly? Well, WebAssembly is a binary format. It is a standard that describes a, an executable function. You can take a high-level programming language like Go or Rust, and you can compile it to WebAssembly so that it can run in a platform and architecture independent way. Now, Go has really good cross-compilation support, so you might be wondering why you need this at all. Well, with WebAssembly, cross-compilation becomes a non-issue entirely. You can compile a single .wasm file, and that exact same file can be run on all the different platforms and architectures that you may need, like ARM, x86, mobile devices, IoT, whatever and it can be embedded. So this is probably what's going to take up the most time during this talk is talking about embedding WebAssembly within another application. And there's a bunch of great reasons why you'd wanna do that that we'll cover in a minute. And I wanna to touch on the difference between WebAssembly itself and the WebAssembly runtime because these two things are often conflated and they are actually distinct. So WebAssembly itself is actually a specification that describes the binary format, whereas the WebAssembly runtime is the thing that actually executes that format. So a WebAssembly module can be run in a number of different kinds of runtimes, such as the browser, uh, standalone WebAssembly runtimes on the server, or others, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So people often ask, why would I want to use WebAssembly on the server? I thought that it was something designed for the browser. Well, you're right in that it was the first thing that WebAssembly was used for, and all of the major browsers started supporting WebAssembly quite a while ago, actually. It's one of the most common things that you probably see on the internet about WebAssembly is these you know, powerful browser applications that were built using WebAssembly. But people quickly realized that the WebAssembly format and WebAssembly runtimes themselves aren't intrinsically tied to the web browser. And so there are a number of use cases that we came up with that make it pretty unique. So, you know, why does WebAssembly make sense to use outside of the browser? Well, it has a couple of really nice properties that make it useful in the web browser because the web browser is sandboxed and all of these other things, but uh, we find ourselves wanting to use it uh, on the server side for some of a lot of the same reasons. So the three tent poles that we very often talk about when it comes to WebAssembly is performance, security, and portability. But when it comes to the server, I also like to talk about hot loading as the fourth uh, major point as to why you would wanna run WebAssembly. So to quickly touch on performance, because we're gonna go into it uh, quite a bit later, the performance of WebAssembly is uh, often billed as near native. So this means that you can get close to, if not the same performance as a native binary compiled for the individual platforms, uh, but you get the benefits of all the other things you see on the screen. So we've already touched on portability, so let's talk about security. Security in WebAssembly is somewhat unique in that WebAssembly is a sandboxed execution model, and it is a deny by default sandbox model. So when you are executing WebAssembly in a WebAssembly runtime, you cannot by default, access anything in the outside world. You cannot make arbitrary syscalls. You cannot just willy-nilly make network connections, access the file system, things like that. The WebAssembly runtime intercepts every syscall or every host call that the module attempts to make, and the runtime is in control of what is allowed through how those syscalls are handled and all sorts of things. This has really great impacts when it comes to supply chain security because you can theoretically, and actually in practice, run untrusted code in a safe way, as long as you're careful, and uh, it really limits the impact of malicious code in a lot of cases. And then when we're talking about the server, I, I like to mention hot loading because I think it's fascinating and I've found it very useful in a number of actual real world scenarios. 
And so this is the ability to actually swap out a WebAssembly module without needing to stop a host process, without needing to drop network connections, without needing to stop serving HTTP requests, for example. And this is really useful because when we are deploying or rolling back code that's running in our cloud environments, we, we really like this property of not having to drop network connections so we can continue to serve traffic. Some of them just might have to pause for an extra you know, beat to wait for the WebAssembly modules to reload. Uh, but actually, if you do it correctly, you can continue to serve requests with old versions and then start immediately using new versions of these WebAssembly modules to serve your requests once the swap is completed. So there's some ways to do it in a really, really nice way. So one of the comparisons that often gets made in the industry is WebAssembly versus Docker. And I want to touch on this because on the surface they do look fairly similar, but they do have some significant differences that, you know, makes it kind of an apples versus oranges kind of scenario. Um, but, you know, they can be used for some similar things. Uh, and people sometimes ask, like, will WebAssembly kill Docker? And I think the answer to that is no, because they serve different purposes. So if we look at WebAssembly, it's a compiled program. You have taken some source code and you have created what is essentially bytecode. Whereas with Docker, you are packaging a lot more than just the code of your application. You're packaging other binaries like curl, like shells. You are adding other files. You have a file system. You have user accounts. You have all these things that make it OS-like. But WebAssembly, on the other hand, is really just a single program. So you can actually think of WebAssembly as just one program that could get embedded into and run inside of a Docker container. So while the comparison on the surface does make a little bit of sense, I think in practice there's actually enough differences that these two technologies both have a place in the world and even in the future. So performance, we kind of touched on this uh, for, a, for a quick second, but we're going to go a little bit deeper on it now. I talked about near native performance, and this is the line that we like to use when we're talking about WebAssembly, but you know, it, it can actually be true, and uh, we'll, we'll look at some performance stuff in a minute with the, with the code. But I want to talk about what we actually mean when we say near native performance. So the term near native performance, uh, it has a lot of undertones to it. There are a bunch of different factors that come into play when we talk about near native performance. So one thing to note is that when a WebAssembly runtime executes a WebAssembly module, it is actually doing some translation between the WebAssembly format and the platform specific uh, bytecode that it needs to actually execute on the machine. And so it can do this in a number of different ways and somewhat similarly to um, you know, the V8 engine, for example, it can do JIT compilation where it is interpreting and compiling com uh, parts of the application in real time. But we can also do ahead of time compilation. So you can actually take the entire WebAssembly module and you can convert it to an x86 binary if that's the way you want to do it. And depending on which of these methods you use, and most WebAssembly runtimes will allow you to choose, you can actually get different performance characteristics. So for example, if you're using just in time, you will often get faster startup times, but the uh, sustained performance over time might be less. Compared to if you use ahead of time compilation, your application might start up more slowly, but the performance over a sustained amount of time would likely be higher and closer to that of a native binary. So we look at uh, different languages slightly differently when we talk about WebAssembly, because in fact, uh, languages often need to package their own standard libraries, their own internal runtimes into these WebAssembly modules, and that can actually affect the performance of the module, especially when it comes to cold starts and you know quickly bringing up new instances of a WebAssembly runtime. So when we look at something like Swift, for example, Swift has a very large standard library and a very large runtime implementation, and all of that gets packaged into a WebAssembly module when you compile it from Swift. And so loading that module and doing AOT compilation, for example, is very slow. So you can actually have quite long startup times compared to the other languages when using WebAssembly, even if it's the same runtime. And then you look at something like TinyGo or Rust or AssemblyScript, they have uh, quite small runtimes and quite small standard libraries. And so the, the modules are several orders of magnitude smaller after being compiled, and that translates to faster startup times. And you know sustained performance can actually be comparable no matter the, the cost of the runtime or standard library. But you know we, we will look at the exact numbers in, in a minute. Um, so let's 
kind of summarize quickly what we saw, why would you want to reach for WebAssembly as a tool? Well, the multi-language support is an important one. It is a format that can be uh, compiled from multiple different programming languages, which is nice. Uh, in our open source projects, for example, you can have a an application that comprises uh, several different languages all in one, and it can seamlessly switch between them without you as the developer needing to do any special work. The WebAssembly runtime is just executing WebAssembly after all. Uh, hot reloading, I think, is an important one to remember because you can swap out business logic, you can roll out new versions, you can roll back versions of your software uh, in you know single digit milliseconds. It's a very powerful tool for managing software deployments in large architectures. And the security model is one of the most exciting things about WebAssembly. And this is, you know, the deny by default sandbox, the ability to more safely run untrusted code, protect yourself against supply chain attacks and all those kinds of things is really, really attractive about WebAssembly. All right, so we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper here and we're gonna look at some actual uh, code examples. We're gonna look at some of the internals of how WebAssembly interacts with the host and uh, we'll look at some performance. So this is a snippet of AssemblyScript. Uh, AssemblyScript is a WebAssembly native language. It is roughly based on the syntax of TypeScript. So it should be somewhat familiar to all the web developers out there, which is a really big benefit to this particular language. And as you can see, it looks fairly normal. We're not having to do anything crazy to get the benefits of WebAssembly. We are um, writing code at a very high level. We're not doing any low level memory management. You know, things are looking fairly normal. We are making HTTP requests. We are working with JSON. All of these things are great. Um, and I'm gonna use, you know, this to illustrate the fact that, you know, WebAssembly doesn't have to be scary. You don't need to learn some, you know, crazy new language. You don't need to do low level, like C-like memory management. You can get into it fairly easily with languages that are pretty familiar to you. So flipping over to the other side, uh, say we take that assembly script code and we compile it to WebAssembly, how would we actually go about running it? Well, uh, we have a, an open source package called Reactor. It's a, Go, it's a Go library that allows you to very easily run WebAssembly modules in Go. And we provide a lot of the utilities, tools, and frameworks that you need to make this happen. So Reactor is fairly low level. Uh, it is something that you would uh, reach for when you want to do something relatively custom. You want to run WebAssembly as part of an existing Go application, for example, and you want to be able to execute you know, user submitted code or hot swappable code in a very performant way. Internally, Reactor is a scheduler, so it can have many, many instances of the WebAssembly runtime instantiated all at once. It will automatically manage pools of WebAssembly instances to make sure that jobs are handled in a very efficient way. So in this particular example, what you're seeing is a, a WebAssembly module getting loaded, in this case, from a mysterious cloud bucket. And then that WebAssembly module, which is represented by the ref uh, variable there, gets loaded into an instance of Reactor by registering it. Uh, and then the, the module is executed by passing it an input. Now, something to note about WebAssembly is that the data types are very primitive, we'll say. There are not yet uh, representations of higher level uh, structs and strings and things like that. Currently, we're limited to things like bytes and I32s, you know, I, uh, F32s and, and other fairly small low level uh, variable types. Now, Reactor handles converting most of these things on your behalf. So we will um, manage the inputs and convert them to WebAssembly compatible memory and then make that memory available inside of your WebAssembly module in a fairly intuitive way. So you as a developer don't need to care about some of these specifics, but in general, you are gonna be passing uh, fairly simple data types around when you're working with WebAssembly. And usually we like to say, just use JSON because it simplifies a lot of things. So when Reactor loads the WebAssembly bytes, uh, it will create an instance with a, an underlying WebAssembly runtime. Reactor supports several different WebAssembly runtimes like WASM Time and WASM Edge. So you can choose which low level WebAssembly 
uh, runtime is actually executing your code. And then it makes those uh, instances available for execution immediately. So there's nothing that you as the developer need to worry about in terms of instantiating and uh, setting up the actual runtime or module itself. So now I wanna take a look at how the WebAssembly module actually interacts with the host. And when I say host here, I mean Reactor or the Go program that is using Reactor to run WebAssembly. So when a WebAssembly module, like the one that I showed in the last slide, makes something like an HTTP request or tries to access a file or open a socket or anything like that, that request, that syscall or host call, is, in, is actually caught by the runtime and the runtime is allowed to handle it in whatever way it likes. And in this case with Reactor, we have added a special set of capabilities to the WebAssembly runtime that give you the common actions that you would need to build cloud applications. So making an HTTP request is a fairly common thing that needs to happen. And so we added capabilities to the WebAssembly runtime to make it happen. Now, the actual runtime that is executing the WebAssembly is actually swappable when you're using Reactor. So you can choose between WASM time, WASM edge, or others, and Reactor will create an abstraction over those runtimes, and they will make the exact same APIs and capabilities available no matter which one you choose. Now, what you're seeing here is actually a screenshot from the Reactor code base itself, and it's illustrating how when the WebAssembly module makes an HTTP POST request, that request is, in, uh, is actually caught by the runtime. The runtime is able to then evaluate it, determine if it's allowed, uh, it can do filtering, it can do security checks, and then it will actually use the Go implementation of that call to complete the request. So we're actually using the Go HTTP library and Go's amazing networking capabilities to do really efficient HTTP requests on behalf of a WebAssembly module. So there's no actual HTTP client built into the WebAssembly modules. They are simply interacting with an interface. And that interface is, is defined by Reactor and mounted to the WebAssembly runtime when it instantiates that module. So I wanted to show this to illustrate the fact that we are actually being very explicit about what we are allowing these WebAssembly modules to do. And it's important because we want to prevent malicious activity. We want to allow ourselves to run this, you know, user submitted untrusted code and be very sure that what is actually happening in the real world is safe and there is no uh, risk to our infrastructure or other parts of our application. All right, so we're gonna dive into some code and we're gonna take a look at actually writing and running some WebAssembly. So we're actually looking at a repository here that uh, you saw the link on the slide, uh, github.com, cohix, gophercon-21. This is a very simple example of writing various languages, compiling them to WebAssembly, and then executing that WebAssembly using Reactor in a Go program. So on the side here, you'll see a number of different programming language names. Each of these is a single function that has been written to demonstrate compiling to WebAssembly, and then we are going to execute it in our main.go function. So in the effort of keeping this very simple, we're just going to be calculating factorials. It's a pretty classic way of demonstrating, you know, the performance of something. We're going to do it with some, you know, relatively large numbers <laughs> to show that we're doing some real work here. But at the end of the day, we are going to be just comparing these different languages to see what the performance differences are between them. So I'll, I'll quickly walk you through how we set up this application. So the Reactor instance is created and then three different modules are registered onto that Reactor instance. We have one for Rust, one for TinyGo, and one for AssemblyScript. And it's going to reference the .wasm files for each of those compiled functions. And then what we're going to be doing is executing a, that function that has been loaded with the input of 5,000. The module for each language is going to calculate the factorial of the number 5,000. And then we're going to do that 100,000 times for each of the languages. We're gonna calculate the amount of time that it takes in milliseconds, and we're gonna see what happens. So let's start by looking at the Rust function. This one is uh, fairly straightforward, as they all are, and we're simply using a recursive function to calculate factorial. Nice and straightforward. 
So as you can see here, this is where some of that abstraction that I was talking about before takes place. So Reactor has both a host library to run WebAssembly, but we also have guest libraries, what we call the runnable SDK or the runnable API to interface on both sides of that boundary, which we call the FFI boundary or foreign function interface boundary. And these two libraries, the one inside of your Rust module and the one outside running that module, collaborate to manage memory and pass data types around and all that kind of stuff. So at the end of the day, what we end up with is this run function and it takes in bytes as input and returns either bytes or an error as output. And so we're just gonna be taking that 5,000 as a string that we inputted. We're gonna be parsing it as an int32. We're gonna calculate the factorial and then just return that as a message. Very straightforward. Now we're gonna use uh, our SUBO CLI tool which is a wrapper around the various language tool chains that you might need to work with WebAssembly. And it includes Docker images that will automatically build your code. So you don't need to install the Rust tool chain or the assembly script tool chain. It will just manage that for you. So if we build the Rust runnable right here, you'll see that we are using that Docker tool chain. It's gonna go in, it's going to grab the code that we've written. It's gonna compile it down to WebAssembly and then we'll be ready to go. So now that it's built that WebAssembly module, we can go ahead and run it. But I'm gonna take a look at the other two first. So let's take a look at assembly script now. The, uh, there's a bunch of code that gets automatically generated that you don't need to worry about. And then there is a fairly similar looking run function that takes in bytes and returns bytes. And we're doing something very similar with a recursive factorial function. And then the last one we'll take a look at is the TinyGo version. So TinyGo, as you may know, is a variant of Go that is designed for small spaces or tiny spaces. And we use this because the WebAssembly modules generated by TinyGo are uh, much smaller than the ones generated by the regular Go, Go tool chain, and we actually get slightly better performance. Now, I know the Go team is working very hard to have you know, full and complete WebAssembly support, and I really look forward to the time when that is complete. Uh, because I'd love to be able to use a single tool chain for everything. But for now, we use TinyGo. So once again, we're using something very similar, a uh, recursive factorial function, and we are calling it in much a similar way as the others. And now that we have all of these, we're just going to compile the other two. So we're going to compile the TinyGo example. Which is going to download the Docker image to do so. I'm just gonna run it natively. And now that we've built the TinyGo version, we are going to build the assembly script version. So now we have three WebAssembly modules that can be executed. And we're gonna go back to our main.go and we're gonna actually execute them. So in this repo, there is a make file, so you can simply uh, execute make run and it's going to go ahead and run that factorial function 100,000 times with the input of 5,000 for each. So as we go through here, we can see the amount of time that each of these languages is taking to calculate that uh, information. So with Rust, about 1,700 milliseconds. TinyGo, also very close to 1,700 milliseconds. Assembly script, 4,600 milliseconds. So you can see that there is a difference between the different languages depending on a bunch of different factors. Now, uh, all of these are using various kinds of optimizations and uh, the tool chains are different and the WebAssembly modules that they output are different because they contain different runtimes and standard libraries and all that kind of thing. But as you can see, out of the box, we have slightly different performance. And I do also want to try running with a different um, WebAssembly runtime under the hood. This is the exact same reactor program, just using a slightly, uh, with, with using a, a different low level WebAssembly runtime. And as you can see, we're getting pretty much comparable results. So the, uh, the actual difference between the runtimes is fairly minimal, uh, but the differences between the languages can actually be more pronounced. So I highly suggest you go take a look at this repository. You can try it out and you can actually go ahead and start messing around with it yourself. All right, now getting back to the slides, uh, we will move on from code time and we'll talk about some use cases. So why exactly would you want to use WebAssembly to build applications? Well, 
there are a couple of pretty major ones and uh, you know a couple of these we as you know suborbital have been uh, working on for quite a while now so we we've been focusing on user submitted code because we think that using WebAssembly to power plugins and you know user submitted uh, functions and modifications is a really powerful use case for the technology but even without any of that, you still get a lot of benefits like hot reloading. So you can be writing your own code and deploying your own code, but still get the benefits of hot reloading, for example, if you allow your application to quickly load and execute new versions directly from your CI CD system, for example. And then uh, there's a particular use case that I think is really uh, compelling, which is using WebAssembly for FAS or functions as a service. And the reason why I think it's pretty compelling is because of that performance story that we talked about earlier, particularly the fast cold starts. We're finding that you can spin up WebAssembly functions in single digit milliseconds or less. You can actually sometimes do it in microseconds because of the tiny binary size, the, the fact that they can be JIT or ahead of time compiled. All of these factors, if you tweak them, you can get these things starting up in order of magnitude more quickly than a container, for example. So there are a lot of use cases where you can you know, quickly scale up and down your ability to handle traffic. You can uh, emulate things like AWS Lambda and actually get similar or often even better performance than these you know, really large scale professionally developed systems just by using a different technology. And you don't have to worry about any of the inherent performance problems that come with technologies like containers or micro VMs. So, I want to touch on a couple of different caveats because, uh, you know, WebAssembly is a young technology. It's not fully emerged and there are some things that you need to keep in mind when you are looking to adopt it. And uh, this starts with being very careful about WASI and capabilities. Now, what is WASI? We have never heard this term before in this talk. Well, WASI is the WebAssembly system interface. And in much the same way that Reactor adds, you know, cloud native specific capabilities to the WebAssembly runtime, like HTTP clients and accessing databases, WASI intends to be something more similar to POSIX and giving common operating system type functions to WebAssembly modules. So accessing file systems, accessing, you know, Berkeley sockets, those kinds of things. And, you know, it's a young standard, it's still emerging, but it is already available. You can try it. The runtimes that Re Reactor uses under the hood all support it. So you can give it a try without changing any code. Um, and you need to be careful with these kinds of things because if you are intentionally running user submitted code that could potentially be malicious or mining cryptocurrency, you want to make sure that you are setting up the WebAssembly runtime in exactly the way you need and limiting the, those capabilities as much as you need to to ensure the safety of your infrastructure. Reactor has a lot of things to help you do this. You can very uh, granularly configure the capabilities that Reactor enables and we make, we make sure that you are able to keep your infrastructure and your servers safe when you are running user submitted code. The next is multi-tenancy. Now, uh, sometimes, you know, being a bad uh, tenant or being a noisy neighbor is a problem when you are running even your own code because you could accidentally introduce a problem, but especially when running untrusted code because you could have people intentionally trying to take down your infrastructure by, you know, running code that will bomb your CPU, take up all of your memory. So WebAssembly helps us because there are, you know, built-in controls to limit these kinds of things. And we can do simple things like limiting memory, CPU, and execution time, but you need to be careful about these settings and just ensure that you are setting sane limits when running your user's code. Next up is data formats. And this is generally uh, differences between programming languages when compiling to WebAssembly. You can't always expect that everything will work perfectly. Like I said, WebAssembly is still a young ecosystem. And so there could be some compatibility differences. Uh, doing something simple like parsing data formats can be a little bit more challenging because WebAssembly has very, very strict data form, uh, very strict data types. And so this can cause problems when you are trying to infer data types, such as when you are parsing JSON, for example. We will uh, look at the package ecosystem just a little bit. And the thing I want to say about it is, you know, you can't just take any old package off of 
uh, your common package registry like npm or cargo and expect that it will just work. Because of the way the WebAssembly sandbox is architected, because of the way that the WebAssembly modules interact with the WebAssembly runtime, you know, code trying to make arbitrary syscalls is not going to work. The WebAssembly runtime does not conform to the Node.js API or to any other common API. It is its own uh, set of capabilities and host calls and, you know, just expecting any old off-the-shelf code to work is probably realistic at the, unrealistic at this point in the game. And so this is something to keep in mind. It can often be circumvented. You can often port or you can often uh, make small tweaks to make things work just as well in WebAssembly, but you do need to be a little bit cognizant and don't expect everything to work right off the bat. Next is cold starts. And we already looked at how performance can vary between different languages. And you know, I touched on the fact that Swift, for example, has a much larger runtime and standard library than some of the others. And this can affect cold start greatly. So when you are choosing languages, uh, either for yourself or for your users to write WebAssembly uh, modules with, you should keep in mind that you probably want to start with something with a very small runtime like TinyGo, Rust, or AssemblyScript. And then finally, if you are going to be allowing your users to write code that is embedded in your own architecture, I would highly suggest communicating with them, making sure that they know the capabilities, the limitations, and the expectations of what this is able to do. Uh, it's not yet a silver bullet. One day, I think it will be, and we're rapidly approaching that time. But for now, we still have some work to do to get it to the point where for example, any Node.js application could run within WebAssembly. We're not there yet, but with a you know healthy dose of documentation, communication, and expectation settings, it's absolutely possible for everybody involved to have a really good experience. So at the end, let's summarize. We'll do a wrap up by covering the what's, why's, and how's because that was, after all, the title of this talk. So what is WebAssembly? It's a binary format that high-level code can be compiled to in order to execute on various platforms with near-native performance and really nice security sandboxing properties. Why you would want to run it include things like hot-swapping code without dropping network connections, running untrusted code, running user-submitted code, or running multiple programming languages seamlessly within the same project. And how you can go about it is by using our Reactor library. This is something that is quite mature. It's been around for a long time now, and we're really happy with the way that it turned out. You can use the runtimes themselves. You can use V8 in a web browser. But for this purposes of this talk, running WebAssembly in Go, we believe that Re Reactor is the best way to do so, and also the easiest. That's all for now. Thank you for listening. I hope you learned a little bit about WebAssembly, and I hope it sparked some ideas about how you could use WebAssembly in your own Go programs please do feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to answer questions, help you get started, whether it's with Reactor or not. We love to help with anything to do with WebAssembly. We have some very seasoned WebAssembly uh, veterans on our team, and we're happy to help in any way that we can. Thank you very much.